Our first session this afternoon is a conversation between Dieter Burkhardt, who you've already heard from, and Julia Gruen, who is the executive director of the Keith Herring Foundation. Julia was born and raised in New York's East Village, the only child of painter Jane Wilson and writer-photographer John Gruen. Through her accomplished parents, she was immersed in visual and performing arts at a young age and enjoyed a social circle composed of some of the most notable artists, writers, musicians, and dancers of the time. She attended Hunter College High School, the School of American Ballet, and American Ballet Theatre School. After three years at Columbia University, she became the studio manager for Keith Haring, a position she held from 1984 until the artist's death in 1990. In 1989, a year after being di diagnosed with HIV, Herring established the foundation that bears his name and appointed Julia as its first executive director, a position she holds to this day. She oversees the foundation's extensive activities, which range from managing its lucrative worldwide program of image licensing to implementing its various charitable programs, which include major donations, most recently to the Whitney Museum of American Art, and to Planned Parenthood. She's also currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the New Museum, New York. She has collaborated on the organization of solo museum exhibitions of Herring's art in over 30 countries. And she's written extensively about the artist for numerous publications and has lectured far and wide on his life, art, and legacy. So please join me in welcoming Julia Gruen in conversation with Dieter Burkhardt. <clears throat> Hello again. I'm very happy that we two can have a conversation now. First of all, thank you very much for your support of this show, which uh, means a lot and without, not possible. <laughs> so uh, I think Julian gave a wonderful introduction about uh, your background. And uh, one uh, you just sent me an email this morning, yeah. which, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> technology. Uh, technology. And it is a statement on herring by the late artist Sturtevant. And there is a text, and it ends with uh, that she said, herring is tremendously important when you look at the whole picture. But why I quote that is actually because you could be understood as the torch holder for Keith Herring. And how did your background, how you grew up, kind of lead you to what you're doing now and how you met him? Um, huh, wow. <sighs> There, there are many ways for me to answer that question, and there are many aspects, I think, of, of indeed how and where and with whom I grew up that informed a certain, certain qualities within me that, you know, though I could not have predicted, you know, that I would one day work for Keith Haring, but that nevertheless in some way prepared me for the kind of role that I have held for quite a long time. Um, on a very, I suppose, somewhat superficial level, but it, not unimportant, I believe, is that by the time I began working for Keith, which was in 1984, he was already a, a, a very well-known artist. Um, unlike many artists then and now, um, Keith, who we have learned through both Dieter's words, through what Jane Dixon has said, uh, he was an artist who was active way beyond the confines of his studio walls. And in fact, he took as much pleasure, if not more so at times, in being out in the world. Uh, what I think assisted me in being a suitable assistant for him <laughs> was 
in a way because he, I wasn't intimidated by being in his orbit. Um, now, obviously, uh, as, as an employee, uh, as someone who was hired to manage his studio, to you know, facilitate various of his projects, and, and you know, in short, to basically do what he told me to do, uh, I had had a kind of background that, that prepared me a bit for that. And, and in my studies, uh, which are in, in, in large part completely irrelevant to the work that I do, but in my studies as a dancer, um, it's a very disciplined uh, uh, form of study. Uh, it's a form of study where you are in service uh, to a choreographer, you are in service to a, you know, a technique that is hundreds of years old, and from that, as well as because of the environment I grew up in with my parents, uh, I was exposed, as, as, as Julian said, to some truly phenomenal um, <laughs> practitioners in, in, in the visual and performing arts. So in a way, I think that all of that prepared me to be a help meet to someone and that someone was Keith Haring, which is not to say that I didn't have my own ambitions to achieve certain things personally. I did, I do, and it is truly um, perhaps, you know, as, as, as surprising to me as it may be to some others, I don't know, that out of uh, a six year period when I worked, you know, basically next to Keith, as it were, um, that that those six years have now become thirty. Uh, that that to me is 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 still somewhat of a shock. <laughs> but uh, how was it when you met him first time? So you had a job interview. I mean, the banal story. Yeah, very banal but story of the job interview. Those of you um, of uh, my generation, of Keith's generation, um, in in those olden days of yore, uh, when one was looking for a job, one often opened the newspaper and went to the classified section. And uh, some of you may even remember an ad campaign from back then, I got my job through the New York Times. Well, I got my job through the New York Times. Um, an ad was run in the, in the paper by uh, uh, Keith's gallery at the time, which was the Tony Schifrazi gallery and the gallery placed an advertisement in the paper. They did not say Keith Haring. They just said, you know, assistant to artist. And um, the story is slightly more convoluted than that, but uh, the fact is, is that indeed, I was hired to work for Keith Haring. Um, the odd bit is that I was hired to work for him by his gallery. Keith knew that the gallery wanted him to have a studio manager, in large part because, as I said at the beginning, this was an artist whose practice was not at all confined to the studio. This is someone who wanted and took enormous pleasure out of being in the world. Um, much of his art had a performative quality, such as the subway drawings, and um, unlike many of his uh, peers and juniors, uh, who were graffiti writers, uh, Keith did not do his subway work or, for that matter, his earlier types of public interventions um, after dark, in secret, uh, climbing over the walls of the train yards or whatever it might have been. He did them in full view of millions of commuters and passers-by, daytime, nighttime, anytime. Um, and as, as, as you've heard, you know, he was also arrested many times for that. But uh, the thing was that his gallery felt, and this I always find rather amusing, even now, all these years later, his gallery felt that by having someone who was managing his studio, that, in a sense, would provide Keith with uh, uh, perhaps more time, as it were, to actually do work in the studio because I, or the studio manager, 
would be somehow keeping everything, you know, more organized, you know, more kind of straightforward, and when there was some project overseas, for example, or if there was a mural that he wanted to do or that he was asked to do, um, you know, I could somehow play a role in keeping those projects more controlled so that he could spend more time in the studio painting. Did that uh, work? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> in fact, it was the opposite. It was the diametric opposite. Because I was there, he could go out. <laughs> he could go farther. He could travel more because I was there to do whatever needed to be done, answer the phone, do the correspondence, um, liaise with galleries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the gallery hired me to work for him. And at the moment when I was hired to work for him, Keith was actually doing a project in Italy. He wasn't even in the city. Uh, when he eventually did return, we had our job interview. And uh, I remember going to his studio uh, and being introduced to him. And he was, as, as you know from having seen the show or seen photographs on the screen or what have you, he was this very young, kind of unprepossessing, uh, perpetually surprised looking young man. Um, I remember very clearly that uh, I was uh, you know, brought into the studio and he had this little tiny table um, and he, on the table was a telephone and the telephone, some of you may even know this telephone, uh, was uh, in the shape of Mickey Mouse. Uh, and so the receiver of the phone actually was docked in those four fingers <laughs> of Mickey Mouse. And uh, I, I walked into the studio, I was, uh, somebody was with me and they introduced me and Keith was on the phone not with Mickey Mouse, but using Mickey Mouse. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, it, we began to talk. And now Keith had, had often had, um, you know, people who you know, were working in the studio, so to speak, as kind of uh, guy, guy Fridays, admin assistants of sorts. Um, but, but really it was more about, you know, Keith, for someone who was as productive as he was and someone who, <sighs> who needed a certain kind of solitude, he was also somebody who wasn't really all that interested in being alone. So he did often have one, two, or three young fellows who were in the studio who would, you know, help move things around or you know, go with him to buy paint or go get coffee or things like that. The point is, he had never before employed anyone he did not previously know. And so this was a first for him. We did not know each other at all. And uh, we were both, I believe, at the time 25 or maybe I was 25 and he was 26, I don't know. Uh, and so as we sat there together, uh, he pretty much turned to me once he put Mickey Mouse down, and said, um, I don't know what to ask you. Uh, <laughs> so that was a little, little uh, non, non-plussing. But um, eventually we, we, we chatted, and I told him about my background. I had worked in some galleries, and I, you know, I certainly didn't you know, go into my personal background in particular. But, um, you know, he was quite interested that, you know, I came, I was born and bred in Manhattan, that my parents were both in their own fields artists, um, that my childhood and, and young adulthood had been spent in the company of some of these really well-known names who, you know, Keith admired as artists, um, you know, like de Kooning and Pollock, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, nevertheless, uh, it was just a kind of, it was a, a little bit of an awkward conversation um, and then somehow in the course of that conversation, it turned to, or a name came up, and it was as if he said, well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was hanging out with somebody, I don't know who, and I was like, oh, I know him. And, and then suddenly it was like, well, I know her. 
Oh yeah, I know those people. Oh, I was at Club 57 that night. Oh, the Mud Club, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I, I think I was there last Saturday. Turned out, we knew so many people in common. We went to the same clubs. <laughs> we just had never met. And I must say that at that point in time, both our own chronological ages, that time in New York City, um, the sort of spirit of the times, the fact that we had all these friends in common, that kind of sealed the deal much more than any sort of professional capacity, background type of thing that you know I could tell him about. How political was Keith Haring in, from your perspective? Well, that, I, that to me, uh, his interest and his passionate concern about sociopolitical issues was evident pretty much from the get-go, you know. And again, I only began working for him in 84. So a lot of this expression of his political interests preceded my ever, you know, knowing him. However, um, that was quite a revelation for me because, you know, he was a young man, and which is not to say that we haven't all, in our younger years, had very great passions about injustices. I mean, as, as teenagers, and uh, you know, I remember, oh my God, you know, even, even as a, as a uh, middle schooler, you know, walking in protests uh, against the Vietnam War. So, I mean, these issues were around us, but here I was, you know, with this young man who not only was so concerned about a variety of social issues, but in fact, you know, those very issues inspired his work to such an extent that that was a, a real learning experience for me because it was palpable. I mean, this was not something that was just, oh, by the way. Uh, and, and it's perfectly true that Keith was, you know, a <laughs> somebody who really enjoyed having a good time. Uh, you know, a, a, as, as Jane said about uh, the fun gallery, um, that Kenny Scharf christened. Um, that was very much the spirit of those times, too. Now, Fun Gallery opened in 83? Or 80... Before. Before. Yeah. Must be 81? 81, 82, I don't, I don't remember. Anyway, yeah. Keith had a show there in 83, that much I do know. Um, but, you know, that, that spirit of, of creating work and collaborating and working within a very, very fertile community where there was an enormous amount of crossover with fashion, with photography, with filmmaking, with dance, with theater, with poetry. Um, it, it, was, it was such a wonderfully collaborative moment. And you know, Keith's interests were so broad that you know, I found, you know, I, I who, you know, sort of had this image of myself, ha, 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 as, uh, you know, this uh, New York City sophisticate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Keith Haring taught me more about life, about love, about generosity, <laughs> about caring, about social concerns. He taught me more about that than anybody else before or since. These are very touching words. And uh, that leads me to uh, how do you, let me repeat it as the torch holder, how do you proceed that project? And what is also like the idea of the foundation as he settled it? Um, you know, we are living and have been for some time, and not only as a result of the, the decimation caused by the AIDS epidemic, but we are living in a time, and as was Keith, of um, the so-called art star. And one might say Picasso was an art star, but in Keith's lifetime, you know, Andy Warhol was the art star. 
and Keith you know, admired him enormously. Not only did he admire his work, but admired the man enormously. And when they finally did come to meet one another, which I believe was in 1983, um, it was a, a true meeting not so much of minds, certainly not of um, artistic technique because their techniques are completely different and their subject matter is quite different, some of it. Um, but it was a meeting of spirit somehow. And the carrying of the torch, which is, you know, Books have been and, and will continue to be written about that peculiar role that befalls people or that one stumbles into. Um, it is a great, great responsibility. It is a great, great privilege. When I mentioned, uh, you know, the AIDS epidemic and and uh, the decimation that that ca that caused, and a phenomenon that arose not only out of that particular period, but the idea that artists' estates and foundations have become very powerful. And, um, and, and, and there are so many of them, uh, is, if not it's, not, it's not new, but in our day and age, um, there have been entire, uh, you know, dossiers of writings about the power, financial and otherwise, of artists' foundations and what they can contribute financially and otherwise to <clears throat> excuse me to supporting various issues and causes um, often those issues and causes are very much connected to the visual arts when these foundations are established by visual artists in keith's case that was not his choice um, I am still often asked, you know, why? Why wouldn't Keith set up a foundation to help other art artists, young artists? You know, this, this doesn't really make sense. Now, I mean, that's, that's, that's a question that maybe doesn't really have a, a, a finite, fixed, and definitive answer. But something else about Keith, when I said that he taught me more about generosity than anybody else before or since, I observed in this young man, my peer, um, a level of giving, a level of caring, and a level of always being mindful and wanting to help those with less, those with less money, those with less opportunity. This, this is something that was absolutely hardwired into him. Um, as, as you've heard, um, Keith's sisters are here, um, as well as his nieces. Uh, and um, I one day want to have a deeper conversation with them about this. But I will speculate that that, um, I don't know what you, what you want to call it exactly, well, that impulse, let's say, as well as perhaps the genetics uh, that caused this man to have this passionate desire to help people, that has to have come from his family. It has to have come from his background. I know he comes not so much from his specific sisters, three sisters and himself and his parents. He has a very large extended family. And um, I, I can only assume, truly, I can only assume until I'm, it is confirmed by somebody who knows better, that um, a great deal of, of this belief 
in the absolute responsibility to help people less fortunate comes from his family background. Now, when Keith did get his HIV diagnosis, that was after I had worked with him for, I guess, um, four years, something like that. We had already, and when I say we, uh, I mean and we were peers and we, we knew a lot of the same people, and, and, but also within my particular world, the world which, which remained the world to a large extent of classical dance, um, it, you know, people were dying every minute. There was a memorial service every other day. It was the most dreadful, dreadful, dreadful of times. Um, and Keith wrote uh, that he knew because of his own background uh, as, a, as a young man in New York City in the late 70s, young gay man in New York City, that he was probably a candidate for the virus. Uh, and uh, when he did get his diagnosis, <sighs> He also wrote about this. Um, you know, he spoke about how devastating it was and how, in spite of his fear that he probably would be infected, one always holds out hope, despite having watched any number of friends and lovers fall. And he speaks about how, upon first learning of this, uh, I won't be able to quote directly because I, I can't remember, but uh, you know, he, he writes about having gone over to the East River and sat on a bench and, and, um, and completely fallen apart, as he would, and who wouldn't, <laughs> and being devastated and weeping. Um, and then somehow, maybe not that day, maybe not the next day, but he realized that while this disease was at that time a, uh, you know, it was a death sentence, um, he didn't know if he, you know, when he would die. We didn't know. He didn't know. And so he sort of, I mean, I, you know, it's a cliche, but he kind of pulled himself up by his bootstraps and said, I'm not going to die today. And I'm probably not going to die tomorrow either. Because and you know he, in many ways, was one of the lucky ones. Um, he certainly had many of the infections that came along with AIDS, but he had those under control, and he had still amazing reserves of energy, and he worked his ass off during those last two years. Um, I mean, he had always worked his ass off, but <laughs> he really, you know, he traveled like crazy. He did exhibitions all over the world. He did murals all over the world. One of the most beautiful murals he made, which exists to this day, and there are quite a lot that still exist. There's, you know, there, there's sometimes you read things about, oh, there's only three murals left in the whole world. No, 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 there are quite a lot. One of the most beautiful ones he ever made he made in June of 1989 on the side of a church in Pisa. You know, imagine, you know, this, this young man who had just turned 31 at that point being invited by the Catholic fathers in the city of Pisa to paint on the side of a church. Um, it, I, you know, I mean, he was as blown away and, and also, you know, entertained by this <laughs> as, as you can imagine. Uh, in any event, he did decide in 89 that with, with his lifespan uncertain, but, but, but certain not to be long, that he would establish a foundation. And, you know, he talked to me about it. He talked to a lot of people about it. Uh, and he decided that the mission of his foundation would be primarily in terms of its philanthropic uh, goals would be a, a twofold. And uh, those two folds <laughs> would be uh, the support, financial support, excuse me, of 
organizations that help bring awareness, uh, direct care, and, uh, and, and occasionally uh, we are in a position to help support research uh, into AIDS and HIV. And the other prong uh, would be, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly after all I've just told you, uh, for us to provide financial support to youth and young people uh, in need, uh, disenfranchised, without resources, uh, to help them in, in their education. These are the two stated mission, you know, prongs of the mission. Um, in, in a characteristically modest way, I will say, Keith did not specifically say that our role uh, or that his foundation's role was to forevermore perpetuate the legacy of Keith Haring. And now, yes, of course, he alluded to that, and it was implicit. Um, this is, as I said, for myself and for those trustees of our board of directors whom he named in his will, this is an extraordinary responsibility um, to preserve and enhance the legacy of an artist whose practice was so radical. Um, I can't say for sure that it would be easier, but I know because I have a painter mother and a writer photographer father that when the time comes that I need to attend to their legacies, it will be somewhat easier uh, because the sort of parameters of their practice were more defined. Uh, that's very interesting. I mean, it's uh, what you actually uh, pointed out in depth now uh, and with also your very personal experience with Keith Haring, of course, uh, actually leads to the proof of uh, the political line, which hasn't ended, because also the foundation is still drawing the line. And in that understanding, I'm not wondering that he would really ask for the support against AIDS, the support of young people, un the privileged, uh, which just expresses his belief in what he has drawn and what he lived. And I would really want to take uh, the po opportunity, having you here, and giving the public the possibility to ask questions. Uh, because I think it was a very good introduction about uh, I think you gave some very sensitive uh, um, images about who Keith Haring was and also what the foundation uh, intend and um, intention is to do. So may I give the word to you? I love that in the concerts always. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, up there. Hi. Hello. Um, I was very impressed to learn that when you started to work on an art, you just started and you didn't go back and correct and, and edit and so forth. It reminded me that uh, there are certain great artists who write as if uh, they were being directed by the spirit. Uh, Bach was known to just sit Uh, 
like Picasso too. There is this beautiful story from the son of Picasso inviting Kiefering Lagarde to paint on the door and he would describe it that he would just start it in front of the door and never walk away and end it and it was perfect and he said it was just like my father worked. Any comment from you, Sai? Yeah, I, I, I mean, to the point of the gentleman up there, uh, I can say that uh, one of the uh, qualities of Keith's work that other artists remark on all the time is indeed just what you have described. But it's not only that. It's A, that whatever he was going to put out there, whether on a canvas or on a wall or wherever it was, somehow it had to exist entirely here first. But that's the place, that's the only place it existed until he put it on the surface. There were no preparatory sketches and the other thing that impressed, impresses other artists, along with the fact that, as, he dis, as Herring described it, you know, he, again, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, he, he, he conceptualized and conceived of these images in his mind, and the actual execution, it was as if, you know, the thought, the image, the composition traveled down his arm into the marker or onto the brush and onto the surface and that he was a vessel for the idea. But what impresses, I think, us all <laughs> along with that and what impresses other artists, visual artists, is that in executing some of these truly monumental works, such as the mural I described in Pisa on the side of a wall, uh, on the side of a church, um, that not only were there no preparatory sketches, but you know he would, uh, I guess he would go there. He would. I mean, I've seen him paint murals. I actually saw him paint that one. In fact. <laughs> He would go there, he would look at the wall, he would spend some time looking at it, he would think about what it was that he wanted to depict. Sometimes there was something very thematic about it, sometimes there might be something, in the case of Pisa, is a very, very beautiful uh, sensitivity on his part to painting in a, you know, a, re a Renaissance city, and the sort of the colors of the city a lot of which is this wonderful um, uh, you know, plaster that uh, is a kind of, you know, has pigment within it. And so you have these, and, and you know, with, with you know, the sun beating down on these buildings for hundreds of years, so these soft ochres and soft terracotta colors, um, which he then employed in this mural Unlike some of his, you know, really like mad, crazy, colorful, vibrant uh, uh, palette that he often used, but he would have the equipment he needed to make these murals, whether it was scaffolding or scissor lifts or cherry pickers or whatever it was. And sometimes he often had assistants who he sometimes just gathered because people love to watch him work, you know. And so people would come and just hang out. And sometimes he would say, look, I mean, I need like 10 of you to help me paint this wall white, for example. So that would get done. But in actually doing the Keith Haring part of it, <laughs> he didn't step back. He, he, he went up and down on these lifts or you know, had people moving the scaffolding on wheels as he moved across horizontally on the work he was creating. And, you know, he started there and he finished there. He didn't step back. And with no sketches. So this sense of proportion and scale, it absolutely boggles the mind. I don't know 
too many people who can do that. Right. Next question. Oh, who was first? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I Hi. don't know if I'm first, but I'll ask. <laughs> I saw the beautiful triptych in the um, Memorial Chapel at Grace Cathedral this morning, and I wonder if you could comment on how important the Catholicism was to St. Harry throughout his life, or certainly at the end. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't Catholic. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> um, he grew up in a family with a sort of loose Protestant background, um, Lutheran Protestant. Uh, and um, you know, while his family was not of Pennsylvania Dutch country specifically, they lived very close to Pennsylvania Dutch country. And um, people have commented, including his family members who would know best, that often, you know, as a young man, this is, a, sorry, a little digression, but often as a young man, seeing all the hex signs painted on the barns and the here and the there, you know, that this was an, an influence in his interest in symbology and semiotics, iconography, um, but of a, of a very sort of American, even though it was German, but American, uh, uh, you know, genre. Um, in terms of the role of religion in Keith's life, as well as in his art, um, if you have seen the exhibition here at the De Young, or if you will see it, you'll notice that there's, you know, there's quite a lot of symbolism in his work that is, you know, it's ancient, you know, crucifixes and hearts and, uh, you know, animals. And uh, I mean, these are not, he's not inventing uh, some new um, sort of alphabet of images necessarily. I mean, some, yes, he did invent. But um, he was deeply, deeply skeptical about organized religion. And especially <laughs> when it was put to ill use. Um, you know, of course, one can think back to the Crusades and the Inquisition and so on and so on and so on. I mean, this was a, a well-read young man and a well-educated young man. However, and I know this has become a little bit of a uh, banal statement to make, he considered himself, and I can tell you he was, you know, quite a spiritual person. But he was not a religious person. However, speaking of the triptych, um, Keith was very aware and had a period as a young man where he was involved in the Jesus movement. So in his searching for identity, in his searching for belonging. His family went to church on Sundays. Keith went to Sunday school for a while. And then he had this kind of obsession with the Jesus movement, which you know didn't last very long, but so much of what one is exposed to at these er in one's early years, uh, you know, it stays with you. And so he also, speaking specifically to that triptych, since it was indeed one of the very, very last projects he worked on, and since with the um, encouragement of the individual who sort of helped him to understand working in this medium, uh, since they decided together that it would be wonderful to uh, use the sort of conventional tripartite screen, as it were, um, the depiction of the Last Judgment um, and the Ascension is a theme which resonated very deeply with him right then and there. So, you know, his, his use of religious symbolism, which is often, uh, you know, portrayed in a negative way, nevertheless, he also had this great sensitivity 
and desire for an, you know, an optimistic end. And, you know, as, as Dieter said earlier, you know, the, the, the role of hope is something that, you know, is very hard to live without. Thank you. <laughs>